Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Leveling is one of the themes that has come to be most closely associated with the, the general idea running behind Søren Kierkegaard's essay, The Present Age, which is part of a larger review essay, The Two Ages. And it's viewed by him as a process that, that really takes off in modernity, and in large part, as we're going to discuss, because of the generation of what he calls a public and, and the press. Here we want to focus on, well, what is this, this leveling in the first place? We want to wrap our heads around what he has to say about that. And one of the best places to start is his discussion about envy and how envy takes the, the, the form of leveling. He doesn't just say that envy is a motive that then leads to the process of, of leveling. Instead, he says it takes the form of. So envy, not just in the sense of any sort of random invidiousness or wishing that you had what somebody else had or wanting to sort of tear them down. He talks about this, this age, the present age, as having envy as a negatively unifying principle in a passionless and very reflective age. And he says, I mean this both in a non-ethical sense and also in an ethical sense. So envy as this negative unifying principle, as he says, becomes leveling. Envy in the process of establishing itself takes this form. And then he has a contrast here. He says that whereas a passionate age accelerates, raises up and overthrows, elevates and debases, you know, brings something up and then crashes it down, what a re reflective, apathetic age does is the opposite of that. He says it stifles and impedes, it levels. And we might also think about it, another term that we could bring in there is it reduces it. it, it instead of just simply like raising things up to pull them down, it, it slowly pulls them down. It erodes, it tries to put everything on the same level, which is why it's called leveling. And what is he talking about it doing there? He doesn't, he doesn't give us the objects of this uh, at that point, but individuality. The individuality of all those individuals out there. They remain individuals in sort of an abstract sense, but they're brought within what in other places Kierkegaard will call the crowd or the public in this essay. They're also doing this to excellence. Uh, he's got a great metaphor about this age allowing things to remain in place, but just kind of slowing everything down, make it, hindering it, making it impossible to really be the excellence that it aims at being. And he talks about leveling, this is very interesting, as being a mathematical abstract enterprise so it, it's also a power. That's another term that he uses for it. And you might say, well, what is he talking about mathematics for? Why does that matter? And you could see in this just sort of a hostility of the humanities perspective against, you know, what we nowadays call the STEM perspective or, you know, science and mathematics and techniques, what we call engineering, right, and the STEM thing. Well, it's not really that as such. Instead, it's, it, there's something else going on there. So if we follow out what he says, 
here's here's a, a very important passage. He says that leveling is an abstract power and is abstractions victory over individuals. In modern times, leveling is reflections correlative to fate in antiquity. And then here he tells us something that gets towards the, the mathematics part. The, the dialectic of antiquity was oriented towards the eminent, the great individual and then the crowd, one free person, then the slaves. At present, the dialectic of Christianity is oriented towards representation. The majority perceive themselves in the representative and are liberated by the awareness that he is representing them in a kind of self-consciousness. The dialectic of the present age, as opposed to those, is oriented towards equality. And it's most logical implementation, albeit abortive, is leveling. The negative unity of the negative mutual reciprocity of individuals. Let's say that one more time. The negative unity of the negative mutual reciprocity of individuals. So we have two things that are important here, unity and reciprocity, and they're made negative in a way. And how can that be done? Well, through this notion of equality and a kind of mathematical equality in this, this case. So he, he goes on and he, I'm going to skip a, a little bit of this. He talks about um, in order to determine how much the excellent individual is worth, the, the coinage standard has been changed so that about so-and-so many human beings uniformly make one individual. Thus, it's merely a matter of getting the proper number, and then one has significance. Now, that not that a weird, paradoxical way to talk about it? You take a number of people, and they become, well, they don't become, they make up, they comprise an individual. What can stand for a center of agency? What can speak for itself? What can take a stand? What is he saying there? He's saying that, for so many people in an age of leveling, and this is part of what brings about the leveling process, they don't want to do things on their own. They don't want to take a stand by themselves. And by putting together a certain number, which then can be compared with other numbers, which can be quantified, which can be polled, which can be turned into, as we would say today, data, you get what we typically would view as a center of agency and responsibility. So he says, nowadays we all understand that so and so many people make one individual and in all consistency we compute numbers. We call it joining together, but that's an euphemism in connection with the most trivial things. Now, doesn't that look forward to our own time in which people come up with all sorts of you know, marketing research, polling data, and, and people say, oh, that must be the case if that's so. I'll give you a prime example of this sort of mindset that I've used in other places. My mother had a boyfriend who was a PR person. He had his own firm. PR is very much public relations oriented towards that sort of thing. He had free tickets uh, for a band here in Milwaukee, and he wanted to give these free tickets to me and uh, a friend of mine. And we were like, well, we don't like that band. And he was like, yeah, but I mean, they've sold this number of albums and all these people like it. And this, you know, the, the concert has this many seats. And we were like, what the hell does that matter? <laughs> you know, we don't, we're not interested in seeing this band live. And you could see in his, in his eyes there was an incomprehension there. And he kept saying the same things over and over again. But, but their, 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 their album is at number what on the top 40? And, it, and we were like, that doesn't matter. That's not what makes for musical quality, nor reaches us as people. But there is a mindset that views things that way. Oh, this person has that many Twitter followers? They must be good. They must have something you know, to say that the rest of us should listen to. This person is on the news with all this panoply of other people behind them, behind the scenes, making this thing happen. Well, what they say must be, if not necessarily true, at least interesting and worth chattering about as we go to work the next day. So this, this mathematical thing, he says a bit more about this that's, that's quite important as well. 
He says, even if a small group of people had the courage to meet death, we today would not say that each individual had the courage to do that, for what the individual fears more than death is reflection's judgment upon him, reflection's objection to his wanting to venture something as an individual. The individual does not belong to God, to himself, to the beloved, to his art, to his scholarship. No, just as a serf belongs to an estate, so the individual realizes that in every respect he belongs to an abstraction in which reflection subordinates him. And he goes, if a group of people in our age could decide, each one individually, to give all his fortune to some good cause, it would not follow as a matter of course that the individual could decide to do it, and again not because he was irresolute about renouncing his fortune, but because he feared the judgment of reflection more than he feared poverty. If ten persons could agree to affirm the full and unqualified validity of erotic love or with no crippling considerations, the limited justification of enthusiasm, it would not therefore follow that each of the ten would be able to do it. For they would still ambivalently love reflection's judgment even more than the rapture of love and the witnessing of enthusiasm with their spirit, Therefore, 10 would have to agree on something in which it is a contradiction to be more than one. And he calls this the idolized positive principle of sociality in our time and calls it the consuming demoralizing principle that transforms even virtues into uh, splendid or glittering vices. And so this is is what he's getting at in talking about this as being a a mathematical uh, power or process or whatever else leveling is. We also want to think about the abstraction part of it. So he calls leveling a reflection game in the hand of an abstract power. It it derives its power in part from reflection and the relations between humans and each other mediated through their ideas about and their fears and desires about what the other people think of them or will make of them. And he tells us, this is quite interesting, nobody can actually halt this process. Why not? Because every time that you try to resist it, you actually play into it. So he says, a demon no individual can control is conjured up, although the individual selfishly enjoys the abstraction during the brief moment of pleasure and the leveling, he's also underwriting his own downfall. The forward thrust of the enthusiast may end with his downfall, but the leveler's success is AO ipso, by that very fact, his downfall. No period, no age, therefore not the present one, can halt the skepticism of leveling. For the moment it wants to halt leveling, it will once again exemplify the law. He says a little bit later, No particular individual will be able to halt the abstraction of leveling, for it's a negatively superior force to the individual, and the age of heroes is past. You won't be able to stand out against it. And he gives not just examples of like, you know, heroes that we typically think of, but heroes within the realm of spirituality and ideas. Reformers, for example. He says, no assemblage will be able to halt the abstraction of leveling. For in the context of reflection, the assemblage itself is in the service of leveling. The minute that you put together a group of people to try to stop this leveling process, you know, for example, to stand up for Western civilization, as you see all these people out there doing this today, and you're like, man, you are the the biggest conformists of anybody that I've seen, right? And you don't even understand what Western civilization is because you're, you're, you're essentially engaging in your own sort of hive mind sort of thing. Um, and he says, not even national individuality will be able to halt it. Why? The abstraction of leveling is related to a higher negativity, pure humanity. So this sounds very pessimistic, doesn't it? Nobody can stop the process. Now, he, he does say at certain points, well, not everything is leveling in this sense, right? It can only take place partially by things that he calls concretions. And a prime uh, example of his discussion of this is a little bit later. um, He says that, uh, here we go. 
The public is not a people. We're going to talk about the public, nor a generation, nor one's age, nor a congregation, not an association, not some particular persons. For these are what they are only by being concretions. So insofar as there is still some like, well, we're, we're from this part of town or we're thinking about things in this way, there's still some like resistance to leveling, but leveling will come along and chew that up. And any attempt to try to hold on to those sorts of things usually play into the hand of leveling. He talks also about the what, what really drives and culminates the spirit of leveling in what he's calling the present age, which is what he calls the uh, public. He goes on and he, he says that... Uh, here we go. For a long time, the basic tendency of our modern age has been towards leveling by way of numerous upheavals. None of them was leveling because none was sufficiently abstract, but had a concretion of actuality. An approximate leveling can take place through a clash of leaders, resulting in the weakening of both, or through one leader's neutralizing the other, the union of the essentially weaker one, so they become stronger. An approximate leveling can be accomplished by a particular social class, or profession, for example, the clergy, the middle class, the farmers, or by the people themselves. But all this is still the moment of abstraction within the concretions of individuality. What changes it? It says, for leveling to really take place, you need uh, a phantom, the spirit of leveling, a monstrous abstraction, an all-encompassing something that is nothing, a mirage, that is the public. The public is not the same thing as people. The public is an abstraction, and it's there. It's been called by different names by other existentialist authors, but it's there as an abstraction that sort of haunts us. You can never find it at any given point, and yet it's always, when you turn your head, ready to talk to you. And people will speak on behalf of the public to tell you you've got things wrong or got things right. You're a good person, a bad person. Now, the last thing to say about leveling is that in a certain sense, leveling is irresistible. But it depends on what ground we're looking at. It's not truly irresistible for the single individual. He tells us, and this is a beautiful uh, passage here, he says, in its immediate and beautiful form, the principle of individuality prefigures the generation in the person of excellence, the leader, and has the subordinate individuals group around the representative. So that's, that's the way things used to go, right? And could still go today, although leveling will come in and you know, take its toll. Then he says, in its eternal truth, the principle of individuality uses the abstraction and equality of the generation as levelers, thereby religiously develops the cooperating individual into an essentially human being. So there's an opportunity here for the, the individual within a context of leveling to evade it and surpass it. Now, it's not going to be in a way that's going to get accolades or people saying, wow, I need to write a, a medium article or do a video or, or you know, do an expose about this person who's evaded leveling. That, that it's not going to be visible in that sense. Those are just are not going to be possibilities. If you are the, the individual, be ready for people not to recognize you as, as such. But he says this, leveling is just as powerful with respect to the temporary, the secular world, even including much of the religious, right? Insofar as they're worried about, you know, should we pave the, the, the driveway? Uh, should we, you know, uh, what, what color should the vestments be? You know, all, all these sorts of things. So he says uh, it, it's powerful with respect to the temporary, with the age, as it is impotent with respect to the eternal. Reflection is a snare in which one is trapped, but in and through, he says, the inspired leap of religiousness, this, this commitment, the situation changes, and it is the snare that catapults one into the embrace of the eternal. So there is a possibility for the individual to not be sucked into this process of leveling. At the same time, you know, 
they can't get some sort of ratification or recognition except from other single individuals, which isn't going to matter for the crowd or the public or the institutions that they're in. If it does, it'll be completely contingent and probably eroded by leveling. How many, here's what we ought to end on. If Kierkegaard is right about this, how many single individuals have in fact resisted this this power of leveling, including Kierkegaard himself. We don't know. We couldn't know because it's not something that you can tabulate, put into a nice spreadsheet or data set. It's not going to fit that sort of paradigm. So what we've got here is this process that that uh, Kierkegaard thinks is happening. It's been accelerating in our own time. It's changed in its nature and particularly so because of the relation to the public and the press. But it is something that isn't an inevitable um, going under of individuality, although it is an ever-present danger.